creativity, and after all, <coughs> that is what we are all about at SCAD. So if everyone could please join me and give a warm welcome together. Come on, lesbians at the party until they look like this. <laughs> 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 yeah, my mother would be like, I mean, I don't care that you're a lesbian, right? But do you have to look like the man? Do you have to be the man one? I know. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. All right, and so that's all. The, that's one of the other reasons why I turned to writing because in my writing, it's just me. I love me. I'm gonna do my work. And I'm going to be so in control of it that no one is going to be looking over my shoulder saying, oh, no, change page 82, or don't write like this. Writing was the one place where I had all the control that I needed. So I think that that's an important element for anyone trying to do big level art is be in control of how your artwork is produced. If you are a filmmaker making indie films, be in charge of the hiring as well. Um, if you are, whatever you're trying to do, right, whatever writing, whatever story, like as much control as you can have for the safety of your artistry, uh, take it and do it. And also don't be afraid to like be that bitch, excuse me, but like, you know, sometimes you, I wish that 36 year old me had been trying to make that indie film and not like 23 year old me. Cause 36 year old me has a voice. 36 year old me isn't afraid of too much these days. And I kind of love harassing and terrorizing men in power. So <laughs> it's a good look, you know? Now I'm a little less scared. Um, but yeah, I would find people that are always gonna rock with you, right? And, and, that, and you know, that includes men too, right? Like after that experience happened, there were a ton of guys that were like, if you wanna make something, I can't believe he did that to you. They weren't on the set, but they had my back, right? Like there's good people everywhere. Um, that's not the joke. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's not, it, it's frustrating, and you will want to like ring people out for the way that they dismiss you, right? The way that they belittle you, the way that the second you walk onto that stage or that set, they are looking for looking for ways to take your power from you and your joy. So you have to, at some point, find it in you to be like, no, I'm protecting this. This is mine. You can't have it. Nothing you say will alter it, change it, or take it away. Yeah, that was a good question. <laughs> All right, thank you very much And that is when they'll also put out like a Spanish version of Juliet. The other indie publisher couldn't do something like that. Um, I think they might also try to do it with the Audible book too. Um, and as far as Marvel comics go, I don't, I don't think there's a, a Spanish only version. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And then for me also like, um, I didn't, I picked up, I understand Spanish, so like if anyone tries to talk about me, I'm totally like, I know what's going on, you know? But um, it's really hard for me to speak back. Uh, yeah, it's a complicated language thing. And even the small amounts of Spanish in America Chavez, I was like having all my like homegirls double check and like, you know, mommy, how do you say like flying through space in Spanish, you know? Um, but yeah, yeah. It's a lot of double checking. Um, but I would also say that if anybody wants to write a comic or anything in their language, like uh, do it, right? Like write in English and the other language or just in the other language, don't feel like you have to italicize or explain or any of that stuff. If people are invested in your work, they'll do the they'll do their own homework. Yeah. Cool. Um, I have a question. How did you go about uh, writing the script for America for the comic? Oh yeah, okay. Um, so America, that's my first comic ever, ever, ever. I never even like I don't draw, I'm just a writer. Um, that was my first comic. Is everything okay? We both have questions, yeah. that's oh, all. Okay. <laughs> no, we're like looking back and forth. Okay, anyway. Um, I, had no, I had no idea how to write a comic. It was like, 
astonishing. And I think if, you know, let's be honest, right, if you look at issue number one to issue number 12, I think you'll see a little bit of a growth, you know what I mean? Um, but to write the script was just like, one, what is the most wild and fun things that I want to do with the series, right? And then like, what can I do in 20 pages? And not only just in 20 pages, it's like totally different um, than fiction writing. Because you're writing in panels, you're writing in blocks of space, you're writing description, but not in the way that you write for a novel, and also dialogue. In, in a novel, you could have as much dialogue as you want. You could have somebody give a monologue if you want. But in comics, it's like maybe, maybe 22 characters in a panel, maybe. And so it was really challenging, um, but also fun. And I got a lot of support um, from the production team. So every comic that you read has its own production team, like a TV show. And so I had Will Moss, he's the one who produced the comic. Oh my God, he's like the best guy. Um, and Sarah. And they did that thing, right? So I look really good on a grant. I'm like Latina and gay, we talk about that. Um, I'm the type of person that'll get hired for a position and then it can go one of two ways. Everything could be awesome or they can be like, oh, we just hired you but you have no power and we'd love it if you just sit there and didn't make any waves and just be a good girl. And I was worried it would be like that at Marvel, but thankfully it was not. Um, when I was writing these scripts, anytime Will had an idea or a way to make it better, instead of saying, we're doing this, he'd be like, oh, hey, um, you probably don't know what a double page splash is. This is what it is, here's a PDF. If you like it, let's use it. I think it would be more impactful here. He also would be like, oh, you wanna bring in Storm from the X-Men? Here's like 10 PDFs from 80s X-Men that we have so that you can learn uh, and you can see. So at every point, he was like encouraging and also offering expertise. So that, that was really helpful in writing the scripts for America. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so with America, so big Marvel fan and there's always a lot of pushback with some members of the comic fandom with women and people of color and being, you know, pushing agendas. How do you deal with that? And because I'm sure there had to be a lot of pushback with some members of. I mean, listen, uh, writing for Marvel Comics was one of the best and one of the worst experiences of my life. Um, there are videos in the hundreds of thousands of views calling me like uh, a white people hater, a bigot, um, a, a ugly fat lesbian troll, like all the things that you like would imagine people could say about me, they have. They've also been very upset that, that I've written this comic. They have also threatened my life, um, put my information on the internet, told their followers to follow me to events like this and harass me. Have my mom's maiden name and my apartment number on a page telling people to show up and do damage. People hate the fact that people like me exist and it's terrible. And for like almost that whole year, I was really rocked. My mental health like took a hard turn. I had no idea people could hate that much. I figured, oh, you know what? Like some people aren't gonna like it, of course, you know? Like whatever, someone's gonna be like, this is the worst comic, and yeah, you know? But no, it was like this whole other level of, and you know what? Like I have to be honest, it was mostly white men doing this to me. Mostly white men literally taking time out of their day to make entire YouTube videos about me. Um, and it's like, why are y'all so obsessed? <laughs> <laughs> Damn, like, you know what? Like, I don't like some people. Like, I mean, you know, whatever. Like, I don't really, I'm not a big fan of Kellyanne Conway, but I ain't writing her hate notes, you know? Like, you know, I, you know, I hope that you're okay, you know? Um, it was hard, it was really hard. And you know what? Like, I have a really good support network. Like, we were talking about communities so important because who rallies? I lived in that time in a queer black and brown house in Brooklyn and when I told my roommates what was happening, both of them left work, they rallied with friends, they came to the house and everybody was on alert. Um, one of my other homegirls, Kat Lazo, she's a producer for Me Too, she came with me to the police station and we waited and was, she was there for me and she rallied for me when the police didn't want to do anything about the levels of harassment and death threats I was getting, right? Um, Marvel and Disney are Marvel, uh, Disney owns Marvel, right? So Disney lawyers and Marvel lawyers were trying to figure out how do we track IP addresses? How do we stop this? They were hacking my website. They had my information on the internet. People were trying to get credit cards in my name because of America Chavez, right? And not in a fun way. 
Um, and so, how did I get through that? Like, I talked about it, I reached out with other people, I had my teams that were helping me navigate, and then at a certain point, like, I went off Twitter, and I stopped even looking at that stuff, and I kind of, like, had to insulate myself, right? Because if you cut off completely, then I miss meeting people like you and talking to folks like you who are invested in the work. But if you're too vulnerable, then you get this constant cascade of, like, destruction. And yeah, you want to be like, oh, they're just people on the internet, but that constant hate against you, I mean, anybody, I think it would take down anybody. And so now at this point, I'm just kind of like, um, I know how to handle it, I can dodge it when I need to, and I just also build stronger communities everywhere else. Yeah, thank you for asking. <laughs> Between these projects, is there one that you kind of enjoyed the process of making more than the others? And um, also, I want to know like what's what's next. What's coming up? Oh, cool. Thank you. All right. So uh, yes, in America, right there. So we have issues one through twelve, and they're available on Amazon. You've got book one, one through six, and book two, seven through twelve. Issue number seven is my favorite, favorite, favorite thing that I've done um, besides Julia Takes a Breath. In issue number seven, Marvel was doing this like identity thing or origin stories. They were doing origin stories all across the like various uh, comics, right? And so for America Chavez, um, I worked with Jen Bartle, who is so glorious. Her artwork is like dream big. Like if Lisa Frank had a like queer Asian comic book daughter, that's Jen Bartle, right? Like, it's so good. Um, and and Amer I was like, yo, what would be amazing? I was like, imagine if in the infinite wonder of the universe, of the galaxies, two black and brown spirits came together and birthed planets. And one of them was Planeta Fuertona, which means like, oh, strong biatch planet, right? Like, <laughs> that's the planet. And so we got to do that, right? We got to. Jen drew the most magnificent image of that, of two spirits birthing a planet. And it's also uh, the, the story of America Chavez when her grandma takes her to the ancestral plane. And in the clouds in the sky, America gets to see the movie of like her grandmother's history, the history of Planeta Fuertona, and like her two moms who have since passed. Because like most moms in stories, they've sacrificed themselves for the universe, right? Like, um, and so, so yeah, so doing that and being like, I can do this in this, like, like just imagining that, like in the world, right? Like in, 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 even in Marvel comics, there's no precedent for that. Like space is hella white sometimes, you know what I mean? Like where do, where do all these planets and things come from, right? Like I was like, where are the, the people of color? And so growing up, my family watched Star Trek. There were always people of color in Star Trek. And so for the origin issue number seven, um, we just got to do really beautiful work and really fun stuff. And so if you can check that out, I would highly recommend it. Yeah, that. Hey, I'm a graduate writing student, and I have a question. So you talk about going and being, your first place you went was an indie publisher. Can you tell us about that process and why if it was mainstream, if that was it, or what was the reasoning? Oh, sure. Um, okay, so I think if, if anybody, how many people here are like writers? Yeah, okay. The number one, there's two things. The number one and two things are not just write, but finish. <laughs> <laughs> that is the difference between you and me. That's the only difference. Finish your thing. Whether it's the screenplay, the book, the series of poems, short stories, finish it. Number two, build your writer's community. That is absolutely important. Go to open mics, go to writer's workshops, anything free. That's all I did coming up in New York was I was going to the New York and Post Cafe and going to, oh my God, when I saw on Facebook that this Latina I didn't know, uh, Afro-Dominicana in Harlem was like, I want all the Latina writers in New York to come to my house. You know I got on the train and went to her house. <laughs> and when the door opened, it was 
was just like a sea of women of color writing, and there were candles and orishas, and I was like, <gasps> it's real. <laughs> you know, like that, to me, that is the most important thing, right? So through my writers' communities, I went on adventures, I wrote about stuff, I wrote on people's couches while I babysat their kids, like, I just did everything. And it was one of those writer friends who was like, hey, that weird adventure that you went on in Portland, Oregon, you should write about it for my anthology. And she was already published, Ariel Gore. She's a prolific writer. Oh my gosh, she's got a book when we were witches. Um, really, really good. Um, she put me in that, and then with that anthology, I was always going to open mics, so there was a reading. So I got on the mic and I read my story, right? Um, and there was an editor publisher in the audience. And he was like, hey, if you turn that into a novel, I will publish you. And I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Quit my job. <laughs> Went on unemployment. <laughs> Before, like, oh my god, but back in the day, unemployment was the best. Like, you know, you could just go on it. <laughs> you know, now they're always like, did you get a job yet? And it's like, no, dude, I'm writing a book. Um, so I did that, and I just took the opportunity. In my head, I, you know, I'm still from the Bronx, so I was like, until I sign a contract, I know it's not real, you know, but the opportunity presented itself, and I took it. Um, and so there's that element, and that person made good on their promise, right? So there's that like little element of magical luck. But then the other side of it was, my writer friends were like, if that person doesn't publish you, we will make sure you get published. Because by that time, six or seven years into the community, you know, you have writers that have been published. You have writers that are publishers. You have indie folks. And so really, it's that. That is like the core of what I would recommend. Like, it, whatever identities you <coughs> feel most connected with, um, or even just general writing groups, that's where you're going to find the folks that are going to publish you. That's where you're going to find the people that are going to say, hey, let's publish you on my imprint, but also I'm going to help you meet this agent, and I'm going to help you put together like a, a package for your book to pitch it. You know what I mean? So, so to me, that is like the core root of, of it. And, and the indie publishing experience for me was cool, but it also uh, respectfully left a lot to be desired. When it comes to Juliet Takes the Breath, the current copy that you are reading in your hands right now was edited by me and my ex-girlfriend. That's it. She was a law student. She knew where to put the commas and the semicolons and all that stuff. <laughs> you know, just like two little like lesbians eating ramen, like trying to figure out how to finish this book. Um, <laughs> so it was like that too, right? And I also had friends where I was like, oh my god, if you read this, I'll cook you dinner. Um, if you read this, I'll watch your babies. Like, there's a lot of like trade and barter elements of it. So I would say really embrace that. Really remember that like the most important thing is that you are a community member and that you have a community that supports you. And, and, and it's like, hey, this work is important. If, if the higher ups don't want it, we got you, you know? Yeah, I would say that. Um, I have a question. <laughs> um, how do you get over a creative block and then what advice would you give to us creatives when we're expected to produce but maybe going through a block? Yes, okay. So one of my favorite people is a woman named Vanessa Martir. She's a Dominicana Honduran writer, teacher out of New York City. Um, and she always would tell me, um, there's no such thing as writer's block. You're just not writing the thing you're supposed to write. And at first I was like, oh, oh what a riddle, you know, like, uh, <laughs> thanks, Yoda, you know. <laughs> but the more I sat with that, the more I was like, damn, that is really true. Um, because there's always something that your spirit, I feel like, is pushing you to write. And then what happens when you try and filter it, you're like, oh, but I got to say it like this. Or like, uh, you know, I don't know how to write a screenplay, so I'm not going to write it like that. I'm going to try to do it as like a fiction, right? Because that's what, what really sells is the fiction. Anytime and every time that you kind of like cut yourself off, that really uh, manifests the writer's block. So I would say if you're feeling that way, what one trick I try to do is like, be like, okay, for the next five minutes, I'm just going to write whatever and not pick up my pen. I'm just going to kind of clear it out. And then that usually kind of gets me um, to the next phase, right? Also, there's like um, 
with writer's block, it's like there's a different energy, right? So you're sitting there, you're writing, you're looking at your notebook, or you're writing on your magic screen, or whatever it is, right? Um, and, and it's killing your brain a little bit to be staring at the like blinking cursor. And so that's when I'm always like, do something else with that same thing. So for example, I'm working on, I'm developing a new comic uh, with Boom Studios. Uh, and I want it to be like <laughs> uh, post-catastrophic global warming effects on the United States, queer kids go on an adventure to save the world, right? Um, I couldn't figure out where to start. So I did something like I made a real life Pinterest board. I threw up giant post-its on my wall. I went and printed pictures, put them up, wrote out my character descriptions, and I made it tactile, and I did something else in my art form that would like pull up this inspiration, right? So whatever that other thing is, if you need to draw, make a painting, do write a song, like the other art forms tend to like uh, offer energy to the writing. So I would definitely recommend that as well. So my question to you would be, um, I know you mentioned a lot about community, and I can see that it's a very big thing for you, which I completely admire, because as creatives, we do need those safe spaces. But what advice or what pearls of wisdom would you give those that's struggling to find community? And not for a lack of trying, but you know, some people come off as intimidating, or some may feel inferior because of how they identify. Like, how do you encourage them to find those community spaces? Or what would you tell them to do in pursuit of those community spaces? Yes, well, I'm, it's like funny, because I'm like a little, I'm a little bit of an extrovert. Um, so my instinct is always to like do it yourself. So like if you need X group, right, like bisexuals who love the X-Men, right, if that's your group, then you start those meetings, right? Like, so to me, there's like that element of it. But also, I mean, writing is a very solitary thing. So there's a lot of times where I have to just kind of sit with myself and be like, I am gonna write today. What am I gonna write about? Pick it out and just kind of like go for it. You know what I mean? So in that respect, like, my self-discipline and like my excitement and my enthusiasm has to be the like driving force. I have to be excited about it. I have to have fun with it. If I'm not having fun, you see me, I'm like bouncing all around the stage. <laughs> like if I'm not having fun, I'm like, I'm out, you know? So, so I think you have to like maybe just ask yourself, what are the writing things that work for you? What does help you? What do you need? And then kind of like figure out a way that makes sense for you to like bring those things into your life. Um, yeah, and also online communities are super helpful too. Um, workshops, a lot of times I couldn't travel to them, but some of my friends would do online winter workshops where you just kind of all like submit your work through a portal and you kind of leave feedback on message boards and it's a little old school, but it, it's an outlet for that uh, contact and that like sharing of, of craft. Um, hi, so I have a question. Um, when you were like starting to come up like as a writer and like really, you know, like before you, you know, spent a lot of the, the comics, um, I'm wondering how you got people to take you seriously as like a queer Latinx artist, you know, like, cause you I- You think people take me seriously? Uh, <laughs> 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 no, I'm listening, I'm listening. <laughs> what I mean by that is like, okay, so I'm also an artist, but I'm a visual artist and I do uh -huh. murals, but people don't trust me because first of all, I'm really radical with the things that I do. And on top of that, I'm young, so they don't like trust that I have the work ethic to do it. But I'm very like determined and I want to push for these things. I'm just wondering like, because of all these like you know identities that you're very like tied to, how did you get people to like listen? Um, that is so real. Like I actually started off in TV film. Uh, I was a production assistant. I worked on movie sets all across New York City, like uh, Boardwalk Empire, Ugly Betty, Sex in the City, Law and Order, um, The International, like all these movies, right? Um, and I was good at like uh, directing them. But then I stopped because it was so difficult to get a crew of men to listen. I even had an instance where one of the, the DP, who was like the main camera guy, just took over 
and was like, no, it's my camera. We're finishing the movie my way. And he was like, what, like six feet? Probably had me by like 180 pounds. You know what I'm saying? What am I going to do? You know, like, no. Stop. You know what I mean? like, it was very frustrating. I had men in the TV film industry be like, if you didn't look like such a dyke, people would want to work with you. If you weren't so ugly, people would want to work with you. Basically, if somebody wanted to have sex with me, that's the way that you get work as a woman in the industry. And it was wrenching. And I, you know, I'm still reckoning with that. Like,